now we're going to move a little bit forward in history to uh, the Nobel Prize. And our speaker today is Dr. Erling Norby. Uh, he served as professor of virology uh, as well as various uh, terms as chair and dean during his 25 years at the Carroll Inst Institute in Stockholm. Uh, he was involved in the awarding of the Nobel Prizes in Physiology or Medicine for 20 years and then served as permanent secretary on the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences with responsibility for the Nobel Prizes in Physics and Chemistry. And uh, he's also been a member of the board of the Nobel Foundation. Uh, currently, he's at the Center for the History of Sciences at the Academy, and uh, Dr. Norby has now published uh, numerous books over the past decade about the Nobel Prizes um, as information has been released uh, 50 years, I believe, after the dates, as he explained to us last night, and he has another book coming out shortly. Uh, he's also vice chairman of the board of the uh, J. Craig Venter Institute, which is advancing the science of genomics in order to better understand the biological world. And intriguingly, at least one source lists him as Lord Chamberlain in waiting at the Royal Swedish Court. Uh, so I look forward to hearing more about that, perhaps during our lunch break. Uh, it therefore gives me great pleasure to invite Dr. Norby to uh, inter de deliver his lecture entitled The Award of the Nobel Prize to Banting and McLeod in 1923. rewarding day so far and um, it's a pleasure to to add some different perspectives to this um, professor Jan Dirk I'm really uh, grateful to this invitation and uh, I should say that by, by training I'm a virologist so I, when I took on this hat that being a, a <coughs> medical historian is something that I've learned uh, as I went as I've worked on this on the Nobel prizes I thought I would make three b brief comments first, and that is the word n noble, which shouldn't be noble, but Nobel. It's equal stress. It's a strange Swedish formulation, but that, uh, and in uh, most cases, of course, with the English language, it becomes noble. And it is a Nobel Prize, but it, uh, the true wording is Nobel. The other thing is I never use the word win a Nobel Prize. It's not a lottery. It's a very, very carefully uh, designed process to try to select a particular recipient for the year in whatever the discipline it's, it's a question of. So you, you get a Nobel Prize because you you're, you're deserve it or you're awarded a Nobel Prize. And uh, yeah, in the last lecture, it was mentioned that uh, someone wrote to the Nobel Committee and said they had perspectives on the way the committee has made it, it, its choice. And uh, then I can just tell you that the Nobel Committee never answers any such critique. It never goes into debate about it. It has made its choice and it stands by its choice. Now, I thought I would start out introducing to you the Karolinska Institute. The Karolinska Institute was created in 1810 and one of the important figures in this uh, was uh, Jens Jakob Berzelius, the very world f famous chemist. And this has in a way um, marked out the character of the institute. It's anchored in basic sciences. Uh, in 1900, it accepted to select the recipients of Nobel Prize. But at that time, the Karolinska Institute was not a full-fledged medical school because when it was created, the Uppsala University, which uh, has a history since the, 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 15th, the 16th century, uh, thought that, that uh, they wanted to control the education of, of physicians. And it wasn't until, in, as you can see, 1906, 1908, that we got the full rights to really award uh, doctorates in medicine and so forth. 
So the Karolinska Institute was composed of perhaps of, or in its leadership of some 15 to 20 professors in various subjects. And uh, when it took on this major responsibility, it could certainly cover certain fields, but there are many other fields that were not well covered. So it, it would last until 1965 before we became a full, a complete university and we could create a medical faculty. Before that, we had a college of teachers that was managing the other. And the college of teachers remained at the Karolinska Institute for quite a while because that was the body that was responsible for uh, confirming the work made by the Nobel Committee and select the Nobel laureates of the but as you can imagine, the number of professors were increasing at the Karolinska Institute with time, and so the body increased. And then um, it, it, there were some particular changes in the, the, the Karolinska Institute is, 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 an, is a state-run university, and uh, there were certain rules about what document you could keep secret and not secret. And because of that, one in the 1970s. Uh, one introduced a new body, which was called the Nobel Assembly. And that is a legally an independent body, and therefore it can keep secrets uh, very effectively. And uh, very wisely at that time, it was decided that uh, we were 64 professors at that time, that the, fi the final number of the Nobel Assembly should be 50 people. So we have this Nobel Assembly of 50 people and of course, today it's very prestigious if you are a professor at the Karolinska Institute to become a member of the Nobel Assembly. But that matches then the work by the committee. So what about the, the committee? Originally, the committee was of the order of, of three people and enlarged to five people appointed for three plus three years. And um, in the 1950s, one started to broaden the, the size of the committee because uh, the field of medicine was growing and then diversifying in many different ways. So uh, one uh, decided to have adjunct members. So there are two parts in the committee. Those that are appointed for three years at a time, and you can be that for two periods, and those that are appointed for one year at a time. And eventually in the 1960s, uh, the work um, uh, was made by a committee of five members of the committee and 10 adjunct members. And that's the way things look today, to, like today. Now, the uh, uh, testimony is not very informative. It's handwritten, it's written in Swedish, and it simply says that, uh, you can, that we are, have the responsibility to give a prize in physiology or medicine, and that is important. And it also should be given for a discovery. And that's the only term of definition that there is. In physics, you can give for a discovery or an invention. In chemistry, you can give for a discovery or improvement. But in physiology and medicine, it's only a, a, a discovery. So, of course, repeatedly, we need to come back to what, how do we define a discovery? What, is, what makes a discovery unique and so forth? Uh, then the Nobel year. The Nobel year is longer than one year because a very important aspect of the process is that we control the nominations. Only people invited to nominate can nominate. So the year before the prize, in someone in September, October, we invite and send, send, send out the invitation, perhaps some three, 4,000 to different modis. And, uh, and they, they are defined uh, by the... Uh, sometimes uh, by, the, by the rules that are, uh, go way back, but also we can add to that. But these are uh, the ambition is to, to retrieve as many a pro good proposals as possible. Uh, but the key thing is that we control the nomination. No one uh, can, on its own, take an initiative to nominate them. And then uh, as the year processes, nominations should be in before the end of January, January 31st. And that's when the work starts. And uh, it's during the coming seven months that the whole work has to be processed. And it, it, it evolved over time and you've used different kinds of evaluations, but always we solve this 
originally within the organization. So these were professors at the Karolinska Institute that were there to contribute. So everyone contributed uh, by, uh, I mean, the, the best of his knowledge, best of his insights. And um, uh, we had different levels of value. We have preliminary investigation and we have also full investigation. The full investigations are really very comprehensive. Colleagues were spending some three weeks in the, on the vacation time in August writing these reviews and submit them to the committee. And it, uh, I think one should emphasize that, that it, of course, the Karolinska Institute is, uh, is known because it has a responsibility, but this has major positive repercussions for the Karolinska Institute. Because of this responsibility, it is a, a well-respected uh, medical school, and it opens up opportunities in our interaction with the scientific community at large. So, uh, so, so this is a little about how, how we go about in, 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 in the work. And uh, I'll show you this just, to the, this is just from one year at the academy, I think in the 60s, all the documents that we have. So there are all the nominations, there are the various evaluations, the various uh, discussions and protocols, and then uh, this material remains secret for 50 years. It takes some patience before you can look into this. But this is what, 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 what happened to me when I have finished as, as a permanent secretary. I'm a former permanent secretary of the Royal Swiss Academy of Sciences. And then I have had my office at the Center for the History of Science and started to use these absolutely remarkable archives. And I would argue that nowhere in the world are there such archives because they are a real-time evaluation of science, the way it's looked upon at that particular time. And when you look at that 50 years later, you can see how knowledge grows, how it becomes apparent that, and that uh, major steps forward have been made. So this has led to, uh, and also I should emphasize, I mean, if you're in a mature retirement age, if you find something like this, it really can keep you going because each year new archives are being unraveled. So, uh, if you, and you have to ask for new permissions, but this has led to publication of four books so far. And I'll show you later, there's a fifth book coming this year. And then the, the original book, the, the up on, on the far left, uh, is more of a general uh, discussing uh, the, the, uh, the principle of the price and so forth. And uh, also I've discussed certain fields that I know particularly well uh, and in some selected price. I have a copy of the book for those who want to have a look at that. But from there on, I, they run on three-year intervals. So the book on the top, top right is from 1960 to 62, mostly physiology and medicine, sometimes also chemistry, and then keeps going to 63 to 65 and 66 to 68. And the, the book that's coming now is then 69 to 71. And I can tell you that this is one of the most rewarding thing you could, you could really be involved in and then really uh, see how, how it, it expands. And it allows you to philosophize about what, what the growing knowledge really means. I mean. So in the first book, I had uh, a chapter on what's called atypical Nobel Prizes, because I'd run into those when I looked uh, at uh, some particular selected prizes. Being a virologist, I look at the 1954 prize for the discovery that you can grow polio virus in tissue cultures. And I realized that Weller and Robbins, they were nominated for the first time in uh, uh, 1954 and received the prize the same year. And you can see that way down on this table. And I had another category where there was no external nominations, but someone in the committee makes a, nob a nomination. Which, which we have the opportunity to do because we can check the nomination before the end of January. And uh, that is another category, a typical Nobel Prize. And in the former one, uh, you would find uh, August 
Krug, and we were just celebrating a week ago the 100 years anniversary of August Krug's Nobel Prize. And the reason was two years later, of course, because of the pandemic. Uh, and then in the end, as you also well know, and we'll see that later, this connects to what I'm going to tell you today. Anyhow, in this, you find uh, then also Banting and McLeod, because the year when they received the prize, it was the first year of nomination. So it is a very, very quick prize. One could say, looking at the, the, the will of Alfred Nobel, it says, one should give a prize to the one who, during the preceding year, has made a major discovery. And of course, uh, we had great trouble with that in the beginning because you need to get some time, you need to get some perspective on what, what the, the prize could, could, could involve and how, to, how it, it's, it, it, let's say, locates itself within the, the realms of, of major discoveries. Uh, but in this particular case, it is, uh, example of, of uh, I think that Nobel would have in his mind, although he couldn't fully appreciate the, 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 the drawbacks of such an arrangement. The other thing is, of course, also Banting that was selected was very young, and he remains the youngest of all Nobel laureates, 28 years old, and uh, he will remain the youngest one forever, because today we never give prizes to people that are or rarely below 40. Uh, what are the other then? Josh Lederberg was 30, uh, 31 when he received the prize, and Jim Watson was 32. These are the, the, those that come close to Banting. You know. So what central figures in this, to the left you see Jens Johansson. Jens Johansson worked with Alfred Nobel in Paris in 1890 on blood transfusion. And he was an important link. And uh, that part about the reason why uh, Nobel was really interested in, in giving the Karolinska Institute this responsibility. And much later on, he was member of the committee. And through, uh, I think it was 1919 to 26, he was a chairman of the committee. And he introduced that in the motivation for the prize, one should use the word discovery. And he initiated discussion about what is discovery, and that is something we carry on discussions about into the present time. What is a discovery? How do you define a, a discovery? And the person to, to the right here, Johan Lillestrand, is a professor, professor of pharmacology, and he was, uh, started his professor career in, uh, I think in 1970. And in 1919 or 1918, he became the secretary of the Nobel Committee. And he remained secretary until 1960, seven years after he retired as professor. So if anyone was a permanent secretary, that, that was the one. That was Joran Lillestrand. And the saying, of course, is that he could write the protocols before the committee had his meetings because he knew everything that was, was moving. So these are two critical characters in this. And uh, what about uh, nominations then? So uh, there were four nominations of, uh, well, well, of, in, that involved Banting and McLeod. Uh, one, you can see them here, the one for Banting only from uh, Krill in, in Cleveland, one from Benedict at Harvard. And then we have August Krug who proposed Banting and McLeod. And then there's one nomination from Case Western for, for um, McLeod. And then it, it took time for the committee to really decide on the price this particular year. And uh, therefore, uh, it, it, it was not announced until the end of October. And one can see then that have been other submitted nominations. And they were all for, for Banting, in fact. So these are the nominations now. Now, I mentioned August Krug, and uh, uh, I won't dwell on this, but I think it's very, very critical. His wife, as I think most of you know, had diabetes. And they, uh, when he had received his prize in 1920, they decided to go to the United States for uh, an extended travel. Uh, they couldn't do that in 21 because uh, of her illness. 
in 22, they were there. So they were visiting Jocelyn in Boston. And at a dinner in, in his home, it was mentioned that there are important things happening up in, in Toronto. And, and, and then, uh, and that is very clear from, from, uh, from letters that ex exist, Marie Crew told her husband, you have to go to see McLoyle up in Toronto. And that's how it all started. So his contact when he came here, it was to interact with McLeod. And from that, he also could extract the right to produce insulin in, for all Scandinavian countries, which is a long story that developed into the Novo Nordisk, one of the largest foundations that there is in, in the world, actually. An enormous success story. And they, they got the right to, to, to repeat the procedures. And it didn't take them, I think, more than four months. They have produced insulin in Copenhagen and, and, uh, together with Hagendorf and so forth. So, but the key person here is Marie Krug. Without her, uh, August Krug were not a nominating, uh, made the nomination that he did of Panting and McLeod. What about, so, uh, so here came this nomination, and uh, the people involved at the Karolinska Institute, you can see here one was uh, Johan August Sjöqvist, he was a, uh, the, the biochemist, and he uh, uh, has reviewed uh, uh, this material, and this is just an extract from what he said. It's my personal opinion that the discovery of insulin in the pancreas started Pancreas. I remember this is actually written in Swedish, and I've translated it to English. Uh, studies of its physiologic effect and its introduction to therapy is of the scope that it can be rewarded with a Nobel Prize in physiology. When it comes to the possible awarding of the prize and its distribution, I side with the nominator, Krug, who is of the opinion that it should be given jointly to Banting and McLeod. The honor of the idea and the initiative goes to Banting in this interpretation. And as can be judged from the publication available and assertions from, oh, assertions from associated persons. And I think the, this, there had been a conference up in, in, in Scotland uh, uh, where uh, this information had been spread. McLeod, at whose department the investigation had been conducted, has been the leader of the scientific investigation. And it seems without doubt that it is thanks to his great contribution that that the discovery has taken on the importance it now has. It deserves to be mentioned that it certainly was not an accident that Banting took his idea to McLeod since he had already previously performed important investigations of carbohydrate metabolism. You can see the respect that this reviewer has for, uh, for McLeod's contributions. Okay, and the other reviewer was Christian Jacobius. Uh, and uh, his, his formulation is the formula. On the other hand, it's more difficult to decide on McLeod's contribution since it's not apparent from the literature. McLeod, who is head of the, the physiological laboratory in Toronto, has previously carried out the investigation of blood sugar. Banting came to McLeod with his idea and developed insulin under his leadership. I have been told that it's very likely that the discovery would not have been made if McLeod had not supervised him, at least not as rapidly as now in the case. Banting is said to have even considered an experimental arrangement which could not have led to the goal, something that was corrected by McLeod. The question, therefore, is whether Banting alone shall be awarded the prize or if this should be jointly awarded to him and McLeod. And on the basis of what I presented by, I'm prone to give Banting and McLeod a joint Nobel Prize, and this is so the background to this proposal. Apparently, there was a lot of discussions in the uh, in the Nobel Committee and the, and the Nobel Assembly. And uh, one professor of bacteriology was a little disturbed by the vacillations, uh, and he wrote, "During the time I've been participating in the awarding of the Nobel Prize." The justification for the award has never been based on hearsay evidence from unknown persons or statement like it is beyond doubt on, on things that are thought of as very possible. In my opinion, it's very necessary that the faculty adhere only to verifiable facts. Otherwise, the faculty risks development of unpleasant 
disclosure as a later date. And clearly, the things were moving so fast, so there was no opportunity, time was, for confirmat for presentation of pub publishing confirmatory evidence. And all that. So uh, eventually the prize was given to, to Grant, uh, to, to Banting and to McLeod, but none of them came to Stockholm. The, the prize was received by the British ambassador in Stockholm, and then they came later on to give their uh, Nobel lectures. McLeod came on May 26th, and Banting on September 15th. And you can read their Nobel lectures uh, there is only one or possibly two citations of the other's name. And, and uh, uh, so it's clear that they were not very well on speaking terms. But what about the other actors on Blanham, Best and others? So uh, Charles Best, uh, uh, and we've already heard a lot about his uh, the involvement on this. He was uh, nominated for uh, the Nobel Prize repeatedly. And there are two actors here that are very, very important. Uh, one is Henry Dale, with whom he did his uh, a doctorate work uh, later on, and who really stands up for, uh, for best and gives uh, uh, almost surprising recommendations. First of all, he, he, he nominates him for his co-line work, and um, uh, says that he should have a Nobel Prize for that. And then he also goes back to the insulin story and start to then writes about uh, what, who did what in that context. And uh, I'm a bit surprised about his heavy involvement in because Henry Dale, I have a deep respect for the way he has interacted in other uh, contexts and so on. And then Ulf von Euler is the, the, the representative of the committee that makes the reviews of best. And Ulf von Euler is also a very, very balanced person. And he is, of course, a part of my coming book because he received the Nobel Prize in 1970. Uh, but he is also very much influenced by Henry Dale because he has been working with Henry Dale. And it's clear that in this case, uh, he is not fully independent in his evaluations. And it ends up saying, first of all, that uh, Best should have been included in the Nobel Prize in 1923. And furthermore, that he is prize worthy for his coaline work, co work, but he never receives the prize. But, and I, would, I have a term that I often return to, and that is a term called Nobeliasis. There are people who are so obsessed with the fact that they deserve to receive the Nobel Prize that whenever the announcement are there to become, they, they wait at their phone and they, if they don't get the call, they are very much disturbed. And uh, this is a sad, let's say, consequence of this enormous prestige that uh, this prize uh, event. And Clearly, the, the, the reason for this prestige, and I won't elaborate that, is that, that there is a considerable respect for the choice of prize recipients. And the man has built this tradition by work very carefully and well done by our predecessors and into the present time. It, there's no other prize that can close to that. That's even, even, I should mention that, the, the, it's something called the curse of the Nobel Prize, because if you receive the Nobel Prize, you don't get any other prizes. And uh, David Boltman has told me that. But, uh, although the, the uh, uh, one did break this curse recently. Now, so, um, uh, so what happened to Best? Best was nominated 14 times, 15 to 54. The main nominator was Henry Dale, who had been the supervisor of his PhD work. The discovery proposal, his work on the lapotropic effect of choline. And then he had, as I mentioned, they largely separately that Best should have shared the 1923 prize to Bentin. Best was subject to four evaluations by Ulf von Euler, who gave support to Dale's nomination. Uh, and uh, so Best was declared worthy of a prize in 51, 52, and 54. However, he never received it. But the other person, that uh, it was James Collip, actually, a highly respected person. And, and the way uh, this chamber play is described here, I think he's the one that really comes out 
the, the cleanest in, in a way. And he was also nominated for a Nobel Prize 11 times between 1928 to 56. And four full evaluations were made, the last one in 51 by Einar Hammerstein, who was a very influential uh, professor of, of chemistry at the Karolinska Institute. Uh, he was not considered worthy of a Nobel Prize and therefore could not really compete in the, in the final discussions. But let me round this off by emphasizing the enormous impact of the discovery of insulin had on research that followed later. I think there's no other uh, biologic compound that played such a role as insulin. And it, as, as I, I heard that at August Krug Symposium, that still today, it, it, uh, insulin is the substance on which most publications are still, uh, are still dom dominating the field. So here is Hugo Terrell receiving uh, his Nobel Prize in 1955, the first professor at the Karolinska Institute. He was very active in, uh, uh, as, a as a reviewer, both at the Karolinska Institute and also at the Academy. So this was the time when Sanger's characterization of insulin was discussed for uh, a Nobel Prize. And I found it most, most interesting, and it gives an, an emphasis on what an enormous impact Sanger's uh, analysis had. First of all, Sanger decided to study insulin because it was the protein that was best characterized and it could be obtained in, in the purest form. And then you can see these reflections in 1953 from someone who really knows the field and he, he reflects on how on earth can a polypeptide chain be built up? And he says, so the independent amino acids do not show a tendency to play in a kind of periodicity, but appear to be positioned without any rule after each other. However, always in a given place. That, so the message here was insulin molecules, they all look the same and they all have the amino acid in a defined position. There are no reverses in position of related amino acids, like for example, loose, isoleucine. Thus, each insulin molecule should be exactly identical to others. Critical, critical. Earlier, one has been reluctant to believe that protein molecules should be reproducible into the smallest detail. And then comes the question, but how would it be possible to conceptualize the synthesis of a protein? If there's no periodicity or other predetermined order, that can be traced in the polypeptide chains, and, that the form, uh, and one would be forced to assume that the formation of even the simplest protein, like insulin, would require perhaps 50 absolutely different specific enzymes uh, to attach each individual amino acid. So in 1953, the, 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 the character of information molecule was not on the radar screen. No one had thought about information molecule at that time. After the double helix, all by saying it breaks open and Gamov and, and, and Watson and Crick realize that nature has not made things more difficult than what it need to be. They have it has decided by evolution to use a remarkably simple system with triplet codes defining the position of the amino acid and hereby uh, it, it has really allowed the, the, the advancement of, of the, all the, the aspects of, of biological products and so forth. So Fred Sanger, uh, and he is one of my heroes in, in this whole field, receives his first Nobel Prize uh, in 1958. And uh, then he gets a second Nobel Prize later on. And then when he's 65, he retires and he tends his garden and he builds his boat and if anyone is a, a, a tall figure in, in, in the Nobel world, that's him. But there's more than this. Dorothy Hodgkin is the third woman to receive a Nobel Prize in chemistry. And what her, uh, so, so she has had this entirely proved. But one of them is insulin. And uh, at the time of a prize, she had already worked on that for 15 years. She hasn't solved the structure. But some eight, nine years later, she did solve the three-dimensional structure of, of, uh, of, of insulin. And 
when Fred Sanger saw that, he said, that's good. I got the disulfides right. <laughs> the two disulfide bonds in them, and he, he managed to put the. But you can follow. I, mean, the, I want to show you, draw something in yellow. That is a, uh, the, that's, you know, the, the third woman to get a Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine, Montecito. She developed a radioimmune assay to detect, among other things, insulin. And this leads me actually to, this is the cover of my forthcoming book. Uh, should be available here in, in August. And the title now I use is Nobel Prize is Genes, Viruses, and Cellular Signaling. And it shows the first woman who received a Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, a split prize with her husband, Carl Corey, uh, in 1947, and with Husey. And what was her studies? The Cori enzyme, glu glucose metabolism, and that is the foundation of the very early understanding of how glucose is, is managed in, uh, in, in our body. And I'm very pleased to, to put this emphasis on a highly neglected field of women in among Nobel Prizes. And uh, I wouldn't be hesitant to make a prediction. We will see dramatic changes in this. And maybe 100 years from now, we'll see uh, dominance of women among Nobel laureates. Who knows? Thank you very much for your interest. In that. OK. So I'd like to uh, thank both of our speakers for some really stimulating discussions. Um, try to find my glasses here. They seem to have been gone. Um, okay, so um, I can't really see through the lights. Do we have any questions? Okay, Molly, uh, there is a microphone. No, the microphone is for the video recording. So... We'll ask you to use that. Uh, hi, my name's Molly Scheichert, and um, it's really fascinating to hear uh, these stories. Um, I was wondering if you could address why um, the Nobel Prize in Medicine is only for discovery, whereas in, in chemistry and other disciplines, it's for, it's for discovery or invention. So we don't know, but this is uh, just uh, Nobel's idea and, and uh, I, I, the word discovery comes back in uh, all the pri prices in natural sciences uh, but in medicine it stands alone and, uh, and why that is um, Nobel must have thought that that it summarized a, a, a quantum jump in the advance of our knowledge in some way you know? and, but uh, even in, in physics and chemistry the, the word invention or improvement are rarely used. I mean, it's, it's also essentially discussion about discovery. But that's a very, a, a very fruitful challenge to, to reflect on what is a discovery. And, and we come back to that in the committee all the time. Uh, and uh, it, it, it must take, in some way, the scientific community with surprise. Uh, always, of course, when we have uh, identified a proposal for a prize, you hear they say, oh, I have said that, or I have thought about that, and so forth. But, but it is a major breakthrough. And then you see, as a consequence of the discovery, an explosion of, of publications in that particular field. So, so there are many ex ways of illustrating what is a discovery. But it's a, you, you can keep on discussing that forever. Mm -hmm. Dr. Drucker. Thanks, uh, actually, to you both. Fantastic lecture. So, Jeff, question for you. One of the distinctions that people make, maybe people in Toronto, about the precedent for discovery is that clearly many people were ahead of the Toronto group in terms of the pancreatic extract and the source and glucose lowering. But, but the actual isolation of insulin, and particularly collapse efforts, distinguishes the Toronto effort uh, and hence may be worthy of 
the prize rather than all of the efforts looking at the pancreatic source. I wonder what your thoughts are on that distinction. Well, I completely agree with that uh, analysis, which I think Allison made specific reference to earlier, that it was the development of a, and I think Collip, uh, in your quote, made uh, amended the citation by saying that it's about making uh, an extract that's useful for people. I think there were no great conceptual leaps with the exception of, of the identific the development of an understanding of hypoglycemia, which was absolutely essential as Zelzer's work illustrates. So I think I would probably add that. And I think a third one I would add that no one else had done was the use of rabbits to develop a standardized assay for the number of units. So I, I think it's primarily for the development of a useful act extract, but that required these two other developments. On the other hand, I think there was absolutely no question by the time that they did their work that there was a pancreatic hormone. The issue was what is it and can we use it? So I greatly enjoyed both of those uh, talks. So I do have a question for Dr. Norby. Uh, you alluded to with uh, 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 Jacobius in uh, the evaluation that was done at the time related to Banting versus McLeod, you know, versus both, uh, that there was, within the quote, uh, a speculation that Banting may have been headed the wrong direction and that McLeod did something to correct that. Is there any documentation as to what that is? So I, I have some speculation, but is there something that would be uh, documented in the archives? So, so as I recall it, those, both this reviewer had been involved in, in some conference where these data had been published, and they, 